this relationship predates, uh, in many ways, um, this administration of this club. This club has had a relationship with Hungary going back to the 1950s with the Hungarian Revolution, where we had sponsored a, uh, a large uh, fundraising event at the old Madison Square Garden for many Hungarian refugees fleeing from communist and Soviet persecution in their home country. Uh, and we've carried that tradition forward to today, to today uh, where we are also facing a, uh, where Hungary is also facing a very similar onslaught of very like-minded Soviet and communist-esque actors, but this time not in Moscow, more in Brussels and London and everywhere else. Um, there's a lot that uh, an American audience can learn from the situation in Hungary. Uh, they share a common fight, a common struggle against uh, globalism, against open borders, against this runaway migrant crisis, against uh, international institutions chipping away at their sovereignty. Uh, these are all things that we can learn and understand from and build uh, a deeper understanding about how to combat them. Uh, and I think in Hungary, they've achieved massive success. They've achieved massive success in standing up for themselves and securing their borders and developing their domestic cultural uh, traditions and you know fighting for them against all the odds, against sanctions practically, where they're withholding money in Brussels, where they're threatening uh, the Hungarian government, not even treating them like an ally. And in fact, Hungary is an ally of the United States. They're a treaty ally. We have obligations to them through NATO. And um, sometimes our own government doesn't act that way. Uh, for all these reasons and more, um, this bond, this relationship is continuing to grow, continuing to foster, and continuing to develop. And I'm very happy and honored uh, that our club can be a small part of that and a small part of uh, advancing uh, our shared common uh, cause and our common uh, fight. Uh, with that said, uh, today uh, it is an absolute honor uh, to be welcoming uh, to New York, to our club, to speak and address you all this evening, uh, the Hungarian Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, Peter Sciarto. Perfect. Uh, I'm working on my Hungarian, but uh, it is uh, it is not the easiest language uh, to to grasp. But uh, uh, the foreign minister, the honorable uh, foreign minister, uh, will be speaking to us this evening. He has been the foreign minister since 2014. I believe he's the longest continuously serving uh, foreign minister uh, in Europe, at least. And uh, he has been leading the way for common sense, uh, common you know common sense as it comes to the situation in Ukraine, where they have been the loudest voice calling for peace, calling for negotiations, calling for an end to the bloodshed, uh, something that we need to hear a lot more of, not just in Europe, but also in the United States. And he has obviously been fighting uh, many of these battles that I just referenced against Brussels, against uh, many Western organizations, NGOs, and others, our own ambassador even sometimes. And uh, it's unfortunate that they have to fight these battles, fight these fights to simply enact uh, their democratic mandate that they received under P Prime Minister Viktor Orban's leadership. And uh, they've been winning resounding uh, majorities and victories in their country, and they are governing accordingly. Um, but he's going to have a lot more to say on all of that. So with that said, I would like to welcome up to the stage the Honorable Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade from Hungary, Minister Peter Siarto. Thank you. Good evening to all of you. Thank you so much for the uh, invitation. I've made a pledge that uh, once I'll have enough time, I will write a book about the ways my name uh, has been pronounced throughout my career. <laughs> and I have to tell you that I'm pretty sure that you have made tremendous efforts in learning our language, because that was a 100% uh, perfect uh, pronunciation, which comes very uh, rarely, sometimes in Hungary as well. <laughs> and. Uh, I really appreciate you reminding um, me on my uh, uh, high school uh, period in the state of Ohio, where I have to tell you that I was 16 when I came over, first time ever far away of the family. And what uh, was really surprising to me, and what I respected a lot and respect since then as well, your, um, your uh, respect and the way you stick to your uh, national uh, symbols, to the nation uh, itself, and how you are not shying, shying away expressing this respect on a uh, continuous basis. Because back in Europe, we were taught in a way that if you emphasize too much your nationality, if you uh, emphasize too much your uh, national heritage, then you are a nationalist, 
which is by definition bad. And when I came here over at the age of 16, and I understood that this is, uh, and here I would use the word bullshit if I was not a foreign minister, uh, and, and, I understood, and I understood that, um, that the way that you stick to your national heritage, the way you show respect to your own nation, to your own uh, tradition, to your own history, is something that must be respected. So with this all said, and uh, expressing my appreciation for the uh, invitation extended to me, and uh, uh, expressing uh, the way I, I consider it as an honor to be able to um, speak before you uh, tonight, I'd like to uh, give you a brief about the tremendous challenges Europe and the European Union uh, has been faced uh, nowadays. There's a package of uh, challenges consisting of three major parts. First of all, obviously, the uh, war in Ukraine. This is a neighboring country to Hungary. And we would have never expected the uh, 21st century in Europe to bring wars, or at least one, to our continent. The second is a uh, continuous challenge of major influx of illegal migration, which has started back in 2015 and has been a continuous challenge since then. And the third is the continuously shrinking competitiveness of the European Union and the challenges regarding economy. And if you raise the question, how on earth it is possible that the European Union was not able to address any of these three challenges in a successful way, then the answer is obvious. The major reason for our failure in Europe to address these major challenges is the liberal mainstream. Because the liberal mainstream does rule basically everything and all spheres of life in Europe. And liberal mainstream makes it absolutely impossible to have rational, thorough, respect-based debates or discussions about any major issue. If you raise in Europe nowadays that it might be better to concentrate on how to make peace in Ukraine than carrying weapons, then you have three options to pick one of these. Either you are a spy of the Russians, or you are a friend of Putin, personal, or you are a damn propagandist of Kremlin. These are the three options. You can choose one. This is what I uh, feel at least once a month as the uh, meeting of the foreign ministers of the European U Union takes place so regularly. And when I, when I collect all my braveness and speak like this, then these are the three options where it usually ends up. Or if you uh, say that uh, the only way foreigners can enter your country is the legal way, is the way that they have passports or visas, and that they show up at the border crossing stations and show their travel documentations. And if they are valid, then they can enter the country. So if you represent this position, then you are just so close to being a fascist or a totally anti-human uh, being. So this is, the way, this is the way how Europe has governed itself to a uh, very deep crisis where we are in. Unfortunately, I have to say this. Because, simply, Europe was not able to manage these three major challenges. The thing is that the liberal mainstream tries to construct an absolute hegemony of opinions. The liberal mainstream says that it is the only progressive and democratic ideology in politics. And if you are not ready, if you are not ready to align with them, if you are not ready to represent the liberal approach or values, then you are anti-democratic, then you are dictatorial, then you are autocrat, and again, a personal friend of Putin. This is uh, very tense. 
Although I have to tell you that the liberal mainstream is the most intolerant ideology uh, that has uh, been ruling over Europe in the recent decades. Because they do not tolerate any alternative opinion. They are not ready to respect the rights of the non-liberals to represent their positions. When you represent a non-liberal opinion in a debate in Europe, you are considered to be a non-European. OK, it might not be the mainstream, but it is European. And when they say that you are not a democracy, they say it because you are not liberal. But in our understanding, democracy must not only be liberal. Democracy is a democracy, period. And it doesn't need any kind of proverb. That's why when we say we are an illiberal democracy, we mean that we are a democracy where it is not the liberal party to govern. And yes, a political system can be a democracy with a conservative government, with a Christian democratic government, with a patriotic government. Of course, in Europe, conservative, Christian democratic, uh, patriotic parties are considered to be populist. Uh, and this is the minimum, uh, what um, they usually uh, say on us and to us. And the liberal mainstream in Europe rules the media and rules the NGO world and rules the network uh, of uh, civic organizations. And since most of the governments in the European countries are either having a very small margin uh, or are being composed of many different parties as coalition governments or are in minority in their parliaments, it's very easy for the liberal mainstream to put pressure on governments. And this is what I feel whenever we, the foreign ministers of the European Union, gather, that I'm one of the very few, not to say the only one, who can say what I think. Because I do not have to care about the danger of an NGO uh, killing the government the next day in Hungary because we have a stable political system. And neither media nor NGOs cannot interfere into the, democratic, into the operation of the democratic political system. But in case of the other European countries, where the governments are fragile, a bad report, a bad cover story, a well-orchestrated action of an NGO can change uh, the government and can kick out those who are the incumbents. So uh, in Hungary, the media landscape is pretty colorful. I would say that around half of the uh, media outlets are kind of supportive of what the government has been doing. Half of them hate us. This is a colorful media landscape. According to the uh, European, uh, current European standards, this is a media dictatorship. Why? Because the liberals do not have a 99.9% .9 share in the media landscape. Because this is the general situation in Europe now. The media is 99.5% okay, 99 uh, uh, liberal. And if you have a conservative media, it is immediately stigmatized. You know, slave media, you know, uh, being sponsored by the government. Uh, this is why I say that the liberal mainstream is very um, uh, intolerant. So I'd like, to, um, I'd like to tell you shortly about these three challenges. First of all, regarding the war in Ukraine. As a representative of a neighboring country, I have to tell you that the European strategy regarding the war in Ukraine has totally failed. Because what was the strategy? The strategy was that Europe feeds Ukraine with weapons, with money, and with information so that Ukraine would win the war, Russia would lose the war, and there would be a political earthquake in Russia. Now, two years have passed. Ukraine is definitely not winning the war. Russia is definitely not losing the war. And the sanctions implemented by the European Union are more harmful to Europe itself than to Russia. And on top of that, and on top of that, with every other day spent in the war, more people die and more destruction uh, takes place. Hungary is the only country in NATO 
which does not deliver weapons to Ukraine. Simply because we know that the more weapons are delivered there, the longer the war will take, and the longer the war will take, the more people will die, and the more destruction will uh, take place. And um, <clears throat> you know, there's a Hungarian community in Ukraine, 150,000. And many of these Hungarians, since they are Ukrainian citizens, uh, have been mobilized to the Ukrainian army. Most of them have been deployed uh, to the front lines. And many of them have died, unfortunately. So when we speak about the necessity of ceasefire and peace talks to be launched, then we say it as a representative of a nation, members of which are dying in this war. So we look at this war from a totally different angle than others. Thanks God, no Luxembourgish people have died yet. Thanks God, no Dutch people have died yet. Thanks God, no Danish people have died. So their approach and their angle, by definition, is totally uh, different <coughs> than ours. And um, you know, sanctions have been uh, implemented on Russia. What is the outcome? What is the outcome? The Russian oil is being uh, bought by the Chinese much cheaper than it used to be sold to Europe. And now Europe is uh, buying uh, much uh, more expensive oil than before. We are being pushed to uh, implement uh, sanctions on the Russian nuclear industry, which, which would be a tragedy to Hungary, uh, given the role Russians uh, have been playing um, in our uh, nuclear energy sector. And what I read in the papers, that Russia became the number one uranium supplier of the United States last year. The US spending more than a billion euros, or dollars, or a billion dollars in Russia to buy Russian uranium. And then we are being pushed to put sanctions on them. And you know, what I see is that uh, the Russian export to oil uh, is being increased to some countries, not to name them. From where the import of oil on behalf of the European Union is increasing big time. <coughs> so then what are we speaking about? The sanctions simply do not work. The sanctions are hitting European economy itself and have no major impact on the Russian economy. So the European strategy regarding Ukraine has uh, failed. On migration, you know, we made it very clear that we stick to our sovereign right to make a decision whom we allow to enter the country and with whom we are ready to live together. And there's no way that any external forces, be it Brussels, Washington, Berlin, whoever, would tell us whom to allow to enter the country. No way. It's our own sovereign right. So when the migration crisis has hit Europe, we have built a fence at our border. We have deployed army, deployed border guards, deployed police 24-7. And for, to give you, an, give you an idea, the year before the last, we have stopped 275,000 illegal migrants at our border. 275,000 in a year. Last year, <coughs> almost 200,000. Imagine what would have happened if we had them, you know, let them come in. How many more would have come, knowing that they could come in? So, and, and you see the outcome. Parallel societies have been created in the Western European countries. You see now the anti-Israel protests uh, on the streets uh, of the Western part of Europe. You see the modern age anti-Semitism raising, uh, not only here in the US, but in the, in the uh, Western European countries as well. And when it comes to economy, you know, the European Union used to be number two in the world when it comes to share of global GDP. Now we are only number three because China has overtaken us. And what's the answer of the German Greens on that? Decoupling. Fine. Which means that all German um, uh, automotive companies uh, will have to you know, uh, look for totally new strategies. Because what happens in Hungary is the following. You know? uh, we are the, one of the three countries in the world, besides China and Germany, where the three German premium car makers are having factories. Who are their number one suppliers? The Chinese. You know, they always ask me to bring their Chinese suppliers to Hungary. But not just to Hungary, and not just to the same city, to the plot next door. You know, to, uh, to uh, decrease supplier uh, chain basically to zero. So, regardless of the uh, failure of, uh, of the European Union in addressing these major challenges, I have to tell you that Hungary has not only survived the recent years, uh, but we proved to be um, really successful. And sorry to say that so bluntly. Uh, and, the, and, the major, and the major basis for, our, for us being successful is that, based on the smart decisions of the Hungarian people, 
the political system is really stable in Hungary. We have won the last four elections, 2010, 14, 18, 22, all of them with a two-third majority in the parliament. And we have not won it on the lottery. This is the decision of the people. This means democracy, by the way, democratic will of the people. Now the European Parliament considers it as a dictatorship, of course, because in Europe, strong leadership, strong political system is supposed to be a threat, a danger, because uh, of, uh, I think, uh, of the memories of the European history in the last uh, century. But uh, I have to tell you that the political stability is the real strong basis of our uh, success. And the last elections in 2022, we won with the biggest margin so far. And that was really unexpected by some of the external forces. After investing tens of millions of dollars in Hungary to push the seven opposition parties from the far right to the far left on the same ticket, pretending that this is going to be the way how we would be thrown out from government. And you know, this massive interference into our elections in 2022 was coordinated from the United States, uh, from the network of George Soros, and from uh, organizations which are not too far from the currently ruling party uh, here in Washington, not to name them. Uh, and I have to tell you that when we look at democracy, for us, democracy is about fulfilling the will of the people. And the will of the people is being ex expressed on the elections. And if you are re-elected three times with a huge margin, that means that your people like what you are doing, simply. If this is questioned, it means that the maturity of that nation is being questioned. And we do not accept anyone to uh, challenge the democratic nature of our political system. And we especially do not accept anyone to uh, question the uh, smartness and the maturity of the Hungarian people when it comes to their ability to make a decision about their own future and about the future of their um, own country. If I want to summarize very, in a very short way our strategy and our vision, then I would summarize it in a way, no war, no migration, no gender. This uh, is um, the uh, strategy of ours. We want peace in Ukraine, because peace is the only way you save lives of the people. It has been proven now for the last two years that there is no solution on the battlefield. To the contrary, what you have on the battlefield is dead people and destruction, but definitely no solution. And no battlefield development will improve the circumstances uh, for peace. When it comes to uh, migration, we made it very clear that we are not ready to receive any illegal migrants in the country. Uh, we keep the fence, uh, we keep the border guards uh, there. And when it comes to, um, you know, um, our society, it is built on families. And when it comes to family, we have a very clear definition. A father, a mother, and the children. And in order to be waterproof, we have put it in the Constitution that father is a man, mother is a woman. <laughs> so in order to make sure that no one understands anything. Um, and we have made a decision that we protect our children from the arrogant uh, and aggressive uh, gender propaganda. So we have banned these LGBT organizations from the schools and from the kindergartens. And we have made it very clear in the regulation that the uh, education of the children regarding sexual orientation is the exclusive right of the parents. And we have forbidden all um, homosexual and um, gender change, or how it is called, propaganda uh, for anybody under the age of 18. And um, we have a very clear uh, approach that once you were born as a man, then the state will consider you as a man. If you were born as a woman, then the state will consider you as a woman during your entire life. Um, last but not least, we look at the United States as a true friend and a true ally. 
although your ambassador in Budapest is working against that very uh, determinedly, but, uh, but we still consider you as a friend and the like uh, of ours. And we will never forget that uh, you have uh, received many of our refugees uh, after the Soviet Union has uh, crushed our revolution in 1956. But it's more than obvious that the current administration um, has a very uh, hostile approach uh, towards uh, Hungary. And it's also obvious that the current administration is interested in weakening Europe. This is one of the reasons, I think, that they are feeding the war uh, in Ukraine. So uh, we want peace, and we want an improved, respectful US-Hungarian relations. And both have a name. Peace has a name, and the improved US-Hungary relations have a name as well. And this name is definitely President Donald Trump. And uh, we, uh, and you know, we are, we are so much fed up. We are so much fed up of, of the phenomenon in international politics that everybody interferes into the issues of others. There are many who think that they are smarter than those uh, who have to make their own decisions about their own country and their own future. So, you know, I have no uh, intention, and we Hungarians have no intention to interfere into the elections of the United States, obviously. And we have always respected the decisions of the American people, and we will continue to respect the decisions of the American people, and we try to work together with the leadership uh, which is elected. But, but politics is a job, or a profession, may I say, based on experience. And our experience is very clear. So no interference, but experience. And between uh, 2016 and 2020, we had the best ever political relationship with the United States, simply because it was based on respect. It was based on mutual respect. And of course, it's a lucky coincidence that we think about migration in a similar way. We think about the role of families in a similar way. We think about peace in a very similar uh, way. But it was based on respect, unlike the current one. So we hope that we can come back to a respect-based relationship between the two countries. And I have to tell you that it's so funny to see the fear in the eyes of my European colleagues when they look at the polls here in the United States. Thank you so much. It's going to be uh, an organized, uh, true Q&A. Uh, please, no statements. Don't talk to us about your divorce or your latest lawsuit. We just want to hear questions uh, that, the, uh, that the foreign minister uh, is eager to answer and to explain and teach uh, and impart his wisdom uh, onto this audience. Uh, we are going to be having a floating mic uh, from our speaker's chairwoman, uh, Haley. So if you would like to raise your hand, she will bring the mic to you, and uh, we can get a few questions uh, in. So if anyone has a question, let's, uh, let's hear it. So we have a, uh, let's get Mike Caprio right there with the glasses and the gray suit. So my question is, uh, how can America best preserve its culture when the American left, much like you're saying in Europe, is trying to destroy our country as a Easy question. <laughs> Well, first, first of all, I uh, don't uh, I don't want to fall into the mistake uh, of uh, thinking about myself that I would know how you could preserve your identity. But what I definitely know is how the attempt in Europe took place to get rid of our identity, and it's uh, very similar to what has been happening here in the United States. And I think that the reason of this similarity is that uh, we have the same network at the end of the story, which is the network of George Soros, uh, who has the ideology of open societies, meaning that it doesn't matter who you are, where you are from, where you are coming from, what you think. It doesn't matter. 
national identity doesn't matter, religion doesn't matter, um, history doesn't matter, your heritage doesn't matter, and we should not let this happen. Should not let this happen. And I understand that the uh, election here, you know, it's going to be a, a, a Super Bowl year of elections. Four billion people will have the right to vote this year. Uh, there will be, I mean, major powers going into elections, including you, including Russia, including the entire uh, European Union, India, Mexico, uh, you know, huge country. And, and I think that, that, that at the end of the day, the future of the world, with just a very small exaggeration, the future of the world for the upcoming years will be decided in a couple of swing states in the United States. And I do hope that you have a strategy how to convince those living in these swing states. And I really do hope that we will not uh, have to be nervous at that night too long. And, uh, and after receiving the results from the first states, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be crystal clear what is the outcome. Because if the United States are not going to impose its democratic, uh, party-oriented uh, uh, political approach on the entire world, then we will be kind of liberated. And we will have a much better chance to preserve our identity, to stick to our religion, to our culture. Because currently, if you uh, speak like this, if you think like this, then you're going to be immediately punished. Politically speaking, look at it. Look, look at us. Uh, the, uh, in the European Union, the, um, the funds which must be paid to Hungary based on the uh, regulations of the European Union have been frozen. Why? Because we are not aligning ourselves with the mainstream. You know, the, uh, the reference is rule of law, but I mean, come on, come on. Our system is not worse than any other in Europe or any other in the world. Simply because of political reasons, funds are being withheld from us uh, in order to put the pressure on us to change. Last year, last year we suffered a lot. Why? Because these uh, stupid sanctions, which, uh, which are a total failure, uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, these two have ended up in skyrocketing energy prices in Europe. We as a country which is totally enforced to imports of energy, our national energy bill has increased from 7 billion euros to 17 billion euros within a year which has pushed the inflation up to 27%, 27%, we usually have like 2-3% of inflation, 27 And the European Union has frozen the, the funds to us. And last year the question was whether you as a conservative government can survive, can survive without the European funds or not. And Brussels wanted to prove that if you do not behave well, if you stick to your identity, if you represent national interest, if you are not ready to say five times a day that Ukraine must win and Russia must lose, uh, then you cannot survive. But we have proved last year, yes, it's complicated, it's full of challenges, but you can. So I mean, sticking, how you can, how you can stick to your uh, identity, how you can preserve that, you know, it's, I think you have, to, uh, you have to be really committed and you have to be really brave. This is the only way. Amen. Uh, for the next question, um, let's get this gentleman right here on the aisle. This microphone. Uh, you you want to put it here? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. And, and, but I have to use this as well? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mr. Minister, a warm welcome to New York. I was with you in Minsk in October at the uh, Eurasian Security ah, okay. Conference uh, when you gave a very polemical and uh, powerful speech there. Uh, part of the scandal was I was the only American speaker among the panels, and you were the only Western leader to speak among the keynote speakers. My question is about war and peace. Uh, I'm with the Schiller Institute. We put forward a proposal for an international conference on a new security and development architecture. Uh, Helm Gazette Revolution circulated this internationally. At the core of it is the Treaty of Westphalia. I mean, our view is that the danger of World War III is extreme, out of control, uh, coming out of Washington, London, uh, complete intransigence, now we have Southwest Asia. What we're putting forward is the idea that 
in this hideous mass uh, genocide war, the Thirty Years' War, certain men said, wait, enough. We have to change principles. And they put forward, as you would know, a couple of key principles. Number one, that you have to act not just in self-interest, but for the benefit of the other. And secondly, you have to engage in mutual economic development. In those days, it was Grant and Albert. So my question is, do, do you see the relevance of that kind of revolutionary thinking that ended the Thirty Years' War, the Treaty of Westphalia, can that be applied today as a work person? Thank you. Well, what I see is the following, that um, definitely there's a totally uh, new age of uh, global political system and a totally new global economic system is being in the making. We don't know how they will look at the end, but it's obvious that there will be something totally new compared to what we have experienced so far. And. Um, Based on that, I think that the, uh, leader, the, the world leaders should come together and find a way how this new world order can be based on a peaceful coexistence, aiming at mutual um, advantage uh, of all the nations around the world. And I tell you why. Because what I see is that um, it's not only the, the real wars, the physical wars which take place, but the trade wars and economic wars are, I think, really, I wouldn't say equally, but really harmful, really harmful. And uh, Hungary has been having a strategy which seems to be successful. Our strategic goal has been set in a way that we would like to be the meeting point of the Eastern and Western economies. Because what we see is that based on all these crises we have been experiencing, the major dilemma at the end is whether the world is going to be divided into blocks in the future, or we will come to the age of, let's put it this way, connectivity. And we Hungarians do have a very clear historic experience. We were losers of the East-West conflict for 40 years. We were among the losers of the world order which was based on blocks. We have lost four decades of our lives being stuck in a communist dictatorship. We were oppressed by the Eastern Bloc and totally neglected by the Western Bloc. So we Hungarians do not want to see another world order based on blocks. We want to see a world order based on connectivity. Because we do believe that the global cooperation can be put on a basis which would end up in mutual advantages. And once again, I have to refer back to the Germans and the Chinese working together in Hungary. Uh, the German foreign minister, uh, green minister. Uh, she usually uses the words or expressions uh, decoupling, de-risking, which are very polite expressions to, um, to speak about the necessity of isolation of Eastern and Western economies. And then I raise the question, how is it possible? I'm responsible for investments as well as foreign minister. How is it possible that the CEOs, global CEOs, of the biggest German companies usually reach out to me asking me to give incentives to their Chinese suppliers to come to Hungary and work together with them there. Otherwise, they have to rethink their whole strategy. So why we do not want to carry out a political strategy for the future which is based on reality and not on an ideological approach? Because the ideological approach, or many ideological approaches nowadays in global politics, have nothing to do with reality, have nothing to do with reality. So I hope that this new world order uh, will be based on common sense and mutual respect, uh, and thus we can avoid that the world would be divided into blocks again. We're definitely entering into an era of multipolarity and real politique. Uh, we'll get a question from Alex Jaros right there in the corner. 
Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us tonight. There's been a headline in the last day about the EU locking horns with Hungary yet again on its national sovereignty law. I would appreciate learning a bit more about why it's so controversial, why it's critical to Hungary, and if it in any way actually does violate EU law, which I doubt it does. Well, thank you so much um, uh, for your uh, question. Here I have to um, come back to our elections in 2022. After uh, spending uh, eight years in office, uh, sorry, 12 years in office from 2010, we were arriving to the elections 2022. The, the Hungarian political landscape is very colorful. On the uh, center right and right spectrum of politics, you have one political family, one bloc, uh, which is Fidesz, our party, with our teammates called the Christian Democrats. We are a monolithic bloc. And then you have many others, socialists, greens, other socialists, more socialists, less socialists, uh, uh, far right, far left, you know. And we have won big time 2014-18 against this fragmented opposition. So they found out that the best way to uh, run against us would be if they unite. They looked at it as a, uh, as a magic chance. But you know, if you see parties from the far left to the far right to unite before elections, then it might be suspicious what's the uh, rational or what's the encouragement behind. And then after elections, uh, of course, they were beaten very badly, and the biggest ever margin. Uh, and uh, they uh, started to blame each other why they lost. Okay. And one of them, who happened to be their candidate to become a prime minister, uh, he wanted to show his um, importance within the camp after losing elections. And he has started to speak openly in a television show about uh, money arriving from the United States even after elections. He was not quite aware that this is a violation of law in Hungary. Uh, because you are not allowed to receive foreign funding uh, for uh, you know, political goals, for elections. <coughs> so the criminal investigation is now going on. And it has turned out that there was a major interference coordinated from here, from the United States, investing tens of millions of dollars into our op opposition in different forms you know, to, uh, to influence the elections. And this is something that we cannot tolerate. We cannot tolerate that uh, foreign funding would decide, instead of the will of the Hungarian people, about the future of Hungary. And of course, now as we introduce this law on sovereignty, to preserve sovereignty, which uh, makes it very complicated for foreign funding to interfere, uh, and uh, it is based on transparency, now, of course, we are again compared with a similar kind of Russian law, which I have no clue about. And to be honest, I don't care whether there's such kind of a law in Russia or not. I mean, who cares? Uh, the Russians should care about it, but not me. Uh, and, um, and, and, and the European Union is now uh, threatening us with procedures because, because Brussels cannot simply digest the combination of two things that there is a anti-mainstream, conservative, Christian-oriented government in Hungary in office, which is successful regardless of its being not liberal. So this is a combination that cannot be digested. And, and they know that such a law will decrease their capacity or their ability to interfere into the next uh, elections, uh, you know. But I have to tell you that. Uh, Interference can take place in many ways. For example, if the ambassador of the United States is the real leader of the opposition. We have that now in Hungary. So uh, uh, the ambassador of the US is the real leader of the very fragmented uh, opposition. And he interferes into uh, the political life of Hungary in many ways. But number one, it's entertaining. And number two, I think it uh, increases our support. <laughs> It, it's not much different than FARA here domestically, and yeah. you know, just goes to show how ridiculous the claims get. Uh, I want to spread around a bit. Um, I guess uh, uh, this uh, lady right here on the aisle. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm actually 
actually a German. Ah, oh, good. <laughs> okay. Um, and the uh, EU, EU European Union President Ursula von der Leyen, she said today that the farmers uh, in Germany and other countries are protesting because they are so much affected by climate change. Now. Now, I happen to know that they're protesting because their production is shut down. And those protests actually of real European people or German people, Spanish people, and whatever, um, is their genuine protests against the policy of their governments, of the European Union. And I wanted to see what, what your take is, because I think is the policy of permanent wars and the policy of economic destruction goes hand in hand in this, what do you call it, maybe neoliberal system. And it's really coming to an end. And how you see how, what role every country, every individual actually can play in the, to come to the multipolarity or to, to this new system. Thank you. Well, obviously, uh, many uh, politicians and many governments in Europe simply do not care about their own voters and simply do not care about the issues raised by their own people. And here I think it's obvious that uh, the farmers are protesting for two reasons. First, uh, that uh, the money uh, which is uh, being uh, sent to Ukraine is actually taken away from them <coughs> because Billions of euros are being sent to Ukraine by the member states and obviously they have to take this money away from somewhere and they take this money away from their taxpayers. And on the other hand, they demonstrate because the, um, the operation, the, the, the way they operate is, is being demolished by the fact that um, grain and other uh, food products are being allowed to be imported from Ukraine in an uncontrolled manner. I, I give you our own example. We are a neighboring country to Ukraine. The, uh, the way the European farmers can operate is a very strict way. There are very, very strict regulations, which of course increase their costs to comply with. And if you allow food import from regions or countries where these regulations are not that strict, where the standards are lower, then you basically ruin the, uh, the way of operation of your own farmers. And what happened to Hungary? After um, the uh, failure of the, um, of the grain deal on the Black Sea, uh, we have offered Hungary as a transit route for Ukrainian grain to, that the grain from Ukraine should be transited through Hungary, through, for example, Romania or Croatia, where the grain can be put on ships and then uh, delivered to uh, Africa or wherever it is needed. What happened? The Ukrainian grain has arrived and was spreading over the market. Okay? Totally against the agreement. Ruining the farmers. Because it was much cheaper, much lower quality, of course, Total different regulation. So what we said, okay, this is a no-go. And we have banned the import of Ukrainian grain by preserving the right to the Ukrainian deliverers to transit through Hungary, but not to sell in Hungary. Huge scandal out of it. Ukraine has sued us at the WTO. In the meantime, they want us, they want us to support their membership in the European Union, but they sued us at WTO uh, for protecting our own market and protecting our own farmers. So you can, you can imagine these uh, kind of double standards. So uh, the problem is that the European leaders are now so far away from their own voters, you know. Because why? Because they want to they wanna satisfy media, they want to satisfy NGOs, and the horizon of them is uh, tomorrow's cover story of the newspapers, you know, instead of thinking strategically. Absolutely. Uh, I think we're going to be doing one more question. Uh, let's see if we could get... Uh, uh, this uh, lady right here in the second row. Why but there's a, there's a chance to change this. Uh, the uh, elections for the European Parliament will take place in June. And we do have the hope that parties like us, 
patriotic, conservative, Christian Democrat, or populist, um, as it is being said about us, uh, will gain strength. And I tell you why. Because in the European Parliament, there has been a very comfortable uh, situation so far that the People's Party, which used to be a right-wing uh, party family, but now is center, not to insult them too much, plus the socialists, and if it was needed, the liberals, and if it was needed, the greens, formed the majority. Simply because the real right-wingers were weak. But now we have a good hope that the right-wing parties will gain strength, and it will not be an automatism that the European People's Party would turn to the left and, and would make coalition with the leftist friends of them, of theirs. So in case the conservative parties can get stronger in the European Union, then we would have a much bigger influence on the decision-making procedures of EU, on the European Parliament itself, and then we would have uh, much more leverage when it comes to the composition of the next European Commission and the, person, the next person of the President of the European Council. So let's cross fingers for the success of uh, the European Conservatives in June and the American Conservatives in November. Now, uh, as an outcome of the last elections in Slovakia, a patriotic government has been elected. But you cannot imagine the headwind they, they had to suffer from. Of course, accidentally and with no, uh, no real, uh, I mean, no, uh, uh, no real goal, the uh, number nine of their list was arrested a couple months before elections. You know, such kind of things happen, of course. Uh, and uh, when we raised the issue that, funnily enough, such kind of things only happen with patriotic parties, you know, then uh, we were considered as, you know, uh, bastard interferers into elections. If, if something similar happened to a leftist candidate, what has been happening to your president, you can imagine the scandal. If it had happened in Hungary that a leftist opponent of ours had been uh, kept away from running on elections by so-called court procedures, then uh, the whole uh, United Nations, the OSCE, George Soros personally, would have come to Hungary announcing the death of democracy and the death of humanity. <coughs> but if it happens to a patriotic candidate, you know, it's rule of law, is the uh, independence of judiciary. We all know these stories. I think it's in, in the state of Maine where the foreign minister of the state. Secretary of State. Sec sorry, Secretary of State can. Uh, make a decision who can run and who is not allowed to run an election. I mean, I, I, will, I will never judge this because this is your country and you decide whether it's fine or not with you or not. But, but then please, please, I mean, not you, but the American administration, don't teach us how to operate a democracy, OK? Because, uh, because then, then we could put lists on the table on both sides and it will, will not, not end up <laughs> in an advantageous way for the Americans, I think. But, but since, but since I'm not an American. I don't care, to be honest, about your political system because you care enough and, uh, and you, you will make your own decision. Uh, so the Slovaks, uh, the Slovak government um, is now a patriotic one. After they entered office, they have stopped the weapon deliveries uh, to Ukraine. They are under enormous, enormous attack, uh, you can imagine. And you know, this shows how the uh, former ideological dogmas uh, are gone and have nothing to do with reality. This party is a true leftist party. We are a true rightist party. And I myself, as a uh, true Hungarian rightist, I was crossing my fingers for the true uh, Slovakian uh, social democrats to win the election, you know? Simply because they are patriots like us. So these old lines of, uh, you know, border lines uh, between uh, political parties based on ideology, I, I don't say they have no significance anymore, but they have a very, very limited significance under the current circumstances of this very new uh, world uh, order. Or uh, Hert Wilders uh, has won the elections in the Netherlands. And you know, uh, the, the Dutch usually teach us Hungarians about democracy. The uh, current prime minister, Mark Rutte, has uh, made even a statement that Hungary should be pushed on its knees. 
And now they are asked for our support when it comes to his candidature as Secretary General of NATO. Possibly we said, OK, I'm mean, coming. Uh, you want us to show or to say our opinion about this and uh, about our uh, uh, upcoming uh, vote on this issue? Uh, so, uh, you know, what kind of, uh, they teach us about democracy and they, they try to do everything in order to prevent the winner of the elections from uh, creating a government. So uh, you know this shows the democratic deficit in the in the Western uh, part um, of, of Europe. So this is where we are, but uh, uh, we are happy with, with the Slovaks. Uh, although it's not EU, but we work together with the Serbs very closely, another uh, neighboring uh, country to us, and then let's cross fingers for the European elections. So I think I counted three, which is good. We're moving in the right direction. So that's always a good thing. Um, I think that was a good question to end on. I think the theme of this evening was that uh, you know Hungary is not alone. There are many friends here in the United States. There is a growing uh, community of people that are uh, interested in Hungary, the Hungarian position, and are uh, supportive of uh, the conservative policies that uh, your government has been instituting uh, from Budapest. And we hope, uh, of course, that uh, we can have our own conservative president once more in November, who will uh, lead the way for a, uh, a return of good bilateral relations that are much more, um, very much deserved. Uh, and of course, uh, we reject the left and their uh, fluid definitions of democracy, which effectively can mean whatever. You know, it's never a democracy in Hungary. It's, it's democratic when we knock Trump off the ballot. So these are all democratic ideals, of course. But with that said, uh, I want to thank uh, the minister once again for joining us this evening. Let's give him another warm round of applause. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Happy. You want to take a quick photo? Yes. Photo?